Hey, hi, Bruno. Nice, nice to meet you. Thank you for, for taking the time to, to be with me today. And why don't we start with you presenting yourself a little bit? Sure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Bruno and I'm a technical educator at the Web3 Foundation, which is the foundation in Switzerland behind the Polkadot protocol and the Kusama network. And previously I've worked at Status on Ethereum 2.0 and I've been in the crypto ecosystem since around 2015, uh, trying to basically do education, uh, DAP development, smart contract development, and some auditing. My focus has always been getting um, <clears throat> Web2 developers involved with the Web3 space so that we can have a kind of a merger of developer uh, mindshare so that people who are, uh, you know, well-versed in Web2 development but have no idea where to even start with Web3 or why they would start with it. Um, so they could get an idea and, and join our ecosystem and see the benefits of, of trying to build something in, in Web3. And that's basically what I do at the Web3 Foundation as well. I'm a technical educator there, so I, m my job is to build proofs of concept, uh, write tutorials, help developers get onboarded, and uh, help them debug issues they might encounter while working with any of our technologies. Amazing, amazing. You are the perfect, per perfect person for what I want to talk about uh, today. Let me tell you very quickly about me, and then, and then I'm going to introduce the, the, the subject to, to anybody who's going to listen to this, uh, this recording. Uh, okay. I've been involved into the vacation rental space, which is like Airbnb, basically, since 2001. And um, I built uh, a booking platform like Airbnb a few years before as a lifestyle business. And that was Web 1, basically. Then Web 2 came, out, came in and basically Airbnb came in, Booking.com, they changed completely everything. And, um, and then in 2013, I got involved in Bitcoin. In 2017, I discovered Ethereum. And that's when I decided that I wanted to work on a decentralized version of, of a booking platform. And I've been working on that ever since. And the project is called uh, Trips Community which is uh, basically a, a community of people who want to make uh, this transition from Web2 booking platforms to Web3 booking, booking platforms uh, real. So in a way, I'm, I'm working on a specific subset of, of what you're working. That's why it's really interesting for me to, to talk to you and understand your, your, your perception on this. And for our viewers, well, that's the story. We, we've been going from Web1, which was in a way the web, the small web of the small people to web two, which is in a way the web of corporations to web three, which is maybe the web of small people or in a way that is not the web of corporations anymore. I put it down a bit messily, but I want to know actually, let, let's start from this. What the hell is web three? Because I've been talking about this for three years now in the travel space people still have no idea. I mean, people are still at the level, oh, Bitcoin, yes, I heard about that, right? So my role and our role as Chips community is a bit to educate people and tell them what's going to happen, exactly as you are doing in general, right? So how would you describe Web3 to a person who lives in Web2 and only knows Web2? Uh, well, Web2 is, I always describe Web2 as the um, internet of walled gardens where you have these corporations that each has its own version of the truth. So they have their database in which their current data set is. And for example, Twitter's truth, Twitter's database doesn't have to match the one that is in Facebook. And in fact, they are not interested in sharing those truths because the more they keep you uh, boxed into their Uh, content they feed you that makes you angry, that makes you click, uh, the more engagement they get from you and the more money from ads they get from you. And so this Web2 world is a world that seems open and interconnected, but is in fact very closed in terms of when you start thinking in terms of uh, corporations that get their use out of your interactions with them. 
Um, additionally, it is the, the web 2.0 is the web of intermediaries. So if you want to send a message to some relative, you can't send a message to a relative. You have to ask somebody to do that for you. So Facebook, please, would you use this messenger server to forward my message along to my grandma? And uh, this is all nice until uh, Facebook doesn't like you anymore. And then your messages will start getting rejected. So it's, it's, a, it's a dual problem of these intermediaries that have too much power and of these uh, abuse tactics by these intermediaries who use your information, your data, and the fact that they have you locked into their features and into their uh, powers to earn money off of you without giving you any, um, anything back, really. Um, so this is, this is what Web, 3, uh, Web 2 is. And Web 3 is designed to uh, commoditize trust, basically. What Web 3 does is it adds the trust layer into Web 2 so that there is one universal truth, there is one global database, and everybody can check the validity of that database. It is no longer stored on some server somewhere but everybody has access to this global database and they can mathematically verify that what my computer says is the same truth as somebody else's computer uh, says about it. So with this global truth, we essentially have uh, created a global database that forces these corporations and people to, um, to accept what everybody else already knows. So to accept our truth, they can no longer just pick a subset, change it, and then pretend like that's the truth, right? Because we, all of us, have the real truth. And now uh, these protocols can also inter interoperate through this one database that has this, this truth, uh, this global truth, right? Uh, all of these different protocols and apps can connect through it and use that one source of information to, uh, to reach consensus on what's written in it. Now, that data that's written in that database may or may, may not be true. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that we can all agree on it. And if that data turns out to be false, we will all agree that it turns out to be false. So there's no longer these, these conflicts. And additionally, uh, with Web 3.0, we are uh, no longer relying on a database in somebody's, uh, in somebody's basement, somebody's server. Instead, we have this shared database and all of us have our... Um, private keys, cryptographic keys, or in other words, passwords that let us change specific fields in that database. So every user is assigned some, let's call them columns in that database, and they can only edit their own columns if they have their own password, their crypto key. And this, um, anybody who has their crypto key can do this. And you don't have to ask anybody else to do it for you. And this is, what, this is where you also get this, this intermediation. You can get rid of these intermediaries who you had to, ha had to ask before to do something for you. You can now do it directly on this database and everybody else who is tuned into this database will see your changes momentarily without anybody being able to stop you from making these changes. And when you put all of this together, you basically have the internet of read. So inter web one was internet of reading. You would just publish a static site. Mm -hmm. Internet uh, 2.0 was read and write. You had interaction. You can post something. You know, I mean, web development isn't really rocket science. It's stuff goes into a box, stuff comes out of a box. Just that box is on somebody's database. So on Facebook, you put something into a comment that's saved in, in a box. Somebody else loads up that comment. It comes out of that box and reads it. Um, that was the read, write web, but now we have the read, write and trust web, right. right? So now you can trust that the person who submitted the comment was actually the person who submitted the comment and did it directly without any intermediaries who could intercept or alter the message or censor it and so on. So now you have this internet where you can trust this common set of data and where it is all so interoperable that we can build dozens or hundreds of protocols on top of this that all communicate with each other without relying on centralized custodians of information and um, arbiters of truth, basically. And that's, that's all there is to it. You just get a trust element on top of the existing internet. Let, let's go back to the problem, because you mentioned the, the, the grandmother who sends a message and we don't know if it's her but actually when i get a message from somebody on facebook the last of the least of my concerns 
is to think that that should is not a real person. So this is not really a problem people feel, I think. Um, maybe after the social network, the social dilemma uh, documentary, people are a bit more aware, etc. But let's see this in, in our space, like in travel and vacation rentals, because there's real use cases where people are really suffering right now. So let me make a thought, uh, thought experiment with you, like ask you, what about Web3? Like, sorry, what about Airbnb on Web3? What kind of problems Airbnb has and what kind of problems Web3 can solve, in your opinion? Right. So there, there are several... Or, sorry, Uber, Airbnb or Amazon, whatever, any market. Yeah. So there are several problems with these uh, service providers that Web3 can, can alleviate. Um, one is that there's a central point of failure. So you have one set of servers that hold all of this information. Not only is this a privacy risk because all of these platforms have their own privacy leaks like quarterly um, where personal information is leaked and then sold and uh, used for things that it shouldn't be used for. Uh, so that's, that's one huge problem, right? There's one person holding all of your data, one, one entity holding all of your data, all of everybody's data. And if that just gets out, it's out. There's no way to put it back in the box. Um, that is a that is a huge problem. Uh, when you have such a central point of failure, then it is a, a, a what we call a honeypot for hackers. There, there's a lot of data, a lot of value in one place, and if you just breach that one place, you get a lot of value out of it. The other problem is that Airbnb, Uber, and so on uh, have basically a, a full control over the fees that they exert on their workers and on the users of their system. So if the user doesn't agree with that fee, with that rent extraction, then they have nowhere else to go. So they have to agree with this, uh, what they're doing, because the network effect of these platforms is just too strong. There's no competition in the Web 2.0 space for them. Anybody who would be launching a new company uh, right now that would rival any of these, it just wouldn't work. Uh, they would have to pull off something truly extraordinary. Um, and so... Well, and additionally, there's the, there's the aspect of, of trust, right? So you have reviews on these platforms and reviews can be gamed, reviews can be faked and reviews can be uh, farmed in bot farms. In, in, like you have these farms where fake profiles or uh, scripts are automatically scrolling cell phones that are, you know, huge farms of cell phones that are automatically scrolling and, and faking reviews and uh, submitting stars and so on. So these are, these are huge problems in these industries uh, that, again, these industries are not exactly incentivized to solve because they're making them money. Uh, this is what's called the Shirky principle. And it says uh, the, uh, any institution that is the solution to a problem will also fight very hard to preserve that problem. Because if that problem is solved, that institution is gone, it's dead. So in a you know, rational way of self-preservation, that institution loses interest in solving that problem. It, it only has interest in maintaining the status quo and earning money on, on its existence. And this is what Airbnb, Uber, and similar platforms do because they are not exactly bothered by these fake reviews. They benefit them. They're not exactly bothered by the fact that people don't like their fees because they're earning money on them and, they, and people have nowhere else to go. Um, and they're not exactly bothered by the occasional leak because all they have to do is make a PR spin, uh, promise that it's not going to happen ever again, and uh, everybody just forgets about it in, in a week or two because another big platform will have another leak in a week or two, and then we'll focus on that one. It just happens so often these days that we don't even care anymore. Okay. Uh, the Web3 here can help in, in different ways. Oh, so it can. Let me, let, let's go yep. to the solution later. Okay, sure. Because now you presented three problems and I was writing them down. You, you said the honeypot problem, like data uh, gets leaked, not if, but when usually, right? Yep. Uh, the fees, they're very expensive and the reviews, which can be fake. So let me give you, let me tell you what the average host or property manager will, will tell about this. And uh, just, just to give you an idea, because I, I went out on, you know, in the wild with these kind of concepts for, for the last couple of years, and I know exactly how people think and what their perceptions are. Because perceptions is everything, right? If there's a problem that people don't feel is a problem, they won't, they won't buy the solution. So they won't buy Web3. Exactly. And the honeypot problem, I mean, until it happens to them, 
who cares, right? It's like, like your credit card or my credit card. I know it's going to be leaked, but you know, until it happens to me, I don't feel the pain. I'm not going to make any effort to like, you know, the, download a Bitcoin wallet or an Ethereum wallet or whatever. So honeypot is a problem, but the perception is really low. Fees, yes. Fees, the perception is strong. People understand there's a lot of money. Um, it, it wasn't at the beginning because people were making a lot of money and Airbnb was getting 3%. And now people less take, make much, much less money. Their operative margins are much lower. So maybe 5%, 10%. And then they realize that Airbnb doesn't take 2%, but takes 17, 18, because they, they remove from the transaction money from both sides, right? So fees is actually a problem. People are happy, uh, will be happy to have a solution to that. Um, so that, that works. And reviews, well, on Airbnb and booking, uh, you, it, it's harder to fake reviews. And let, uh, you should make bookings. So you have a like... A, a cost because you should make the, the actual bookie. But cheap advisor is much easier to be, to be like fake. So fake reviews are not really a, a problem people perceive. They are, and I would say reviews on these platforms are more or less, um, you can trust them. Uh, there are of course political actions in which some reviews can be removed and some not, et cetera. So let me tell you the real problems. And, and, and I want to ask you what you think about this. The real problems in, in terms of uh, what people perceive, and, and I think they actually are real problems. So uh, the biggest problem today in this industry is, um, and you mentioned it, is that you are captured into these silos, right? If you are an Airbnb or booking.com host and you have a thousand reviews, Okay, and this is particularly true with Airbnb. You've been working for the last five years and you got all these guests and you've been very careful on, you know, making them happy and you got your five star reviews, etc. And tomorrow morning, one guest comes in, uh, sees some blinking light on your CO2 detector and thinks it's a camera and writes to Airbnb and says, This guy put a camera, Airbnb very often shuts down your account. So deplatforming. platforming of course, you're familiar with this term, right? Right. That's a real problem. This is something really people are getting scared and fear sells. So I got to the point to tell people, guys, you are at risk because every year which passes here is more uh, of your value, which is locked into these silos. We need to get this out and Web3 takes this out. So what, what do you think about the... Uh, the trust, because you mentioned like it is the internet of trust. So how does Web3 solve the, the problems you mentioned? Yes. And the trust, so the, the reputation basically. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really good example with, uh, with the camera and the, and the fear mongering. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a scary one. I would not want to be a host uh, with that much effort put into the platform and then that happened to me. That's, that's terrible. Um, well, in, in, in the Web3 space, permanent actions on, in the Web3 space usually require some kind of collateral being put down by anybody who's changing the state of the system. That means if I want to put down any kind of a review, uh, the, the strength of my review, the strength of my report will depend on my previous reputation. And my reputation there is the stake that I'm putting in. Uh, alternatively, there can be literal stakes. So you can have a like some tokens that you have to put down in order to have a certain uh, weight applied to your vote, to your to your statement, to your review, or whatever. But uh, Web three changes this in that it attaches these permanent, I wouldn't call them identities, but profiles that you can build, um, and you have full control over that profile, over that that little piece of crypto space uh, with your crypto key. And whatever gets applied to your address, to that key, you can take with you. And you don't have to rely on just one platform to read it and interpret it. So if somebody just creates a new crypto address and uses that to report or make a wrongful accusation on a platform, that's just not going to carry much weight in most platforms. But if 
that's being done by a user who has not only used that platform, but also has a reputation of being a very active user in the ecosystem from other platforms as well. Um, that can include anything from decentralized finance to other booking platforms to video publishing platforms that are decentralized, really anything. And all of this is visible on that little uh, chunk of crypto space that the user owns. Then that vote can automatically count more. Um, but this just this just prevents these uh, fake reviews or or I, I wouldn't even call them malicious. It's more like paranoid reviews that people just put in and then can cause irreparable harm. It's kind of like being accused of some sexual misconduct today, even though you didn't do anything. There's no way you're getting that that stain off of you. You know, it's it's you you just don't want it to happen to you. Um, so this is what these reviews can can really do. But this and and this this aspect really does kind of solve it because you can easily discredit these uh, reviews that don't mean much that that don't have a lot of substance. They can be very jarring. They can be very dangerous if taken uh, seriously. But you can prove that they are not to be taken seriously. But the deplatforming is a much bigger concern, in my opinion, and that's why I'm especially uh, passionate about. Uh, Web3 alternatives to uh, app stores. So that, that's, that's one of the biggest problems today in how, for example, Apple is embroiled in these legal battles with, um, with Epic, who are making Unreal Engine oh, yeah. and Fortnite. So like they've been deplatformed because Apple is taking 30% of every sale made on the platform and not a single app that's being, that's being installed through the app store is allowed to charge for anything through itself. It, ca it has to go through Apple. So this also affects these booking platforms, right? So they also have to pay additional tax to Apple and there's no avoiding it because Apple owns the hardware, they own the software and they own the cloud from which you install the software and through which you use the software. And this is where the disintermediation really comes in uh, and, and shines and makes it possible to avoid these um, really mobs that are extracting the value from you. And there's no way like Apple can kick Epic and Unreal and Fortnite off the platform today, but in a Web3 universe, they cannot do this. Um, because if, if you have the buy-in of the community if the community wants you there the community will have you there because that's the web3 that's the that's the global truth that we all subscribe to if i'm present on the platform which is the global blockchain that everybody has uh, is connected to then everybody can find me there and if somebody blocks a user interface like an app store that's reading from this chain if that user interface blocks me from being visible another user interface will show up that will show me. And this goes uh, especially for these booking platforms. If somebody is removed from a platform because of, of a bad review, an alternative UI can just pop up and show that um, entry regardless uh, and take into account new factors on that paranoid review and you know, use that to judge whether or not some entry should be shown or not. Well, there's even another layer which uh, the, the, the centralized platforms do not have, which is the uh, dispute management. I mean, Airbnb has a dispute management system in which I can tell, look, this guy, and let's go back to the deplatforming, this guy is an idiot because that's a CO2 um, detector, which, by the way, you sent me because Airbnb sends this, right? Or, by the way, you forced me to put. And do not do that for me because this guy is just lying. And Airbnb sometimes uh, decides to do for me because they just have too many hosts. So the decision is like, okay, we got too many hosts in, uh, in this city. Whatever reason we, we're given, we're just going to cancel them because they have to keep a balance, right? And with Web3, you can have a third-party decentralized dispute management systems um, like uh, Kleros or now Aragon Court, something like that. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Yep. So we can basically uh, tell anybody who's working on Web3 with, with these new platforms, uh, the decision of, of, you know, whatever regarding your booking is, is done by third parties who have no vested interest in, in kicking you out, basically. And that makes people feel much better. And as you were saying, I'm trying to make it in a, explain it a bit more simple way for, for my audience. Uh, 
a platform or a tree can kick you out. They can stop showing your listings, but your listings are still there and your reviews are still there. There's gonna be uh, another thousand platforms is gonna show them. So the, the big issue in my opinion today with decentralized platforms is that they have everything together. It's like church and state is together and history has proven that this leads to concentration of power and abuse. Web3 is separating reputation and listings in a way. Reputation and OTA, online travel agency. So it separates all the pieces in, a, in Legos, like we talked about Legos a lot, or Legos, I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, this summer we defy, right? So you own your piece of land, your listing, your reputation, your customers, this is yours. And other people can add pieces, but you never lose control on that. That's the big, the big revolution which Web3 brings. So it's, it's so obvious to me that this is with the way forward. And at the same time, it's so hard to explain. I'm sure you get the same frustration often. I don't know who you're talking to, but how yeah, is your experience it, with that? It's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to sell it because like you said, most people don't feel affected by the problem until it's too late. And when it's too late, it's already too late to join uh, this. Because if you have a network effect and you have a good platform, let's say you have a YouTube channel with a bunch of subscribers, or you have a good hosting, good, good, uh, good uh, booking that has a bunch of good reviews, and you have this network effect that makes people uh, flock to you it makes it just makes business come to you you're you don't feel threatened it's very comfortable and then uh, people just lose sight of the fact that they can just lose it overnight um, if that platform just decides that they don't like you they will just cut you off but then because you have locked your entire network into that platform you lose your entire network they cannot come with you because you have no way of letting them know where you are now. And this is, this is what I try to tell people, like don't diversify just your money as you know, basic economics 101 and stuff. Diversify your network effects if your business depends on a network. Like if you have a well-reviewed location on Airbnb, if you're hosting and if you're a super host and if you have a few locations or on, on, on Airbnb that are very, um, popular. Don't be exclusive to Airbnb. Uh, start building that audience outside it. Um, there are ways to take your people with you. And there are ways to, I know that Airbnb is incredibly strict in even in you even putting links into descriptions of your, of your bookings. Even Airbnb so you, links. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you have to be extremely clever on, on getting people to come with you. And that's a whole other challenge in itself. Um, but there are ways which will let you spread the word of your uh, network outside of the locked-in network that you have at Airbnb. Examples include like being able to, um, people usually have when they, when they book on Airbnb, for example, people usually have, um, they, when you don't meet the host, they will give you a code that you punch into the lock or whatever, or a little box that will give you the key or into the key or into the door itself and it'll let you in. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's, that's fascinating on its own. Like you, I mean, in, in, in 2020, you are able to rent out your empty apartment and earn money for it without ever meeting the person that's going in there. Uh, that's absolutely crazy. Like if you told anybody 20 years ago that that would be a thing that they would be like, what's wrong with you? No way. Um, and that, that's amazing, but uh, you can take it up a notch. Uh, there was a project called Slocket uh, years back and they had a similar idea for renting things where you would put a lock onto say a bike and let's say you wanted to rent out that bike. You could do it on the blockchain through that cryptographic address. So essentially, I would buy some token on the chain. So this is like this crypto economy. I would buy this token. This token would end up in my wallet. And if I approach that bike's lock with my wallet, and that wallet has that token that the lock wants, that lock will spring open. 
And when that lock unlocks, I can, I, I can use the bike. For as long as I'm using the bike, there's a, there's a counter going. And when I lock it back up again, my token will disappear. I will no longer be able to unlock it. And for however much it was unlocked, I will pay from my account automatically. Um, and this can be done with Airbnb as well. You don't have to use codes to, to open doors. You can use cryptographic tokens on your mobile wallet or whatever, so that you can um, literally own the permission to enter somebody's apartment. And over that permission just automatically burns up. It just disappears and you no longer have the ability to enter the apartment. And so if you add a little sprinkle of crypto knowledge into every Airbnb booking that you do, maybe you give NFTs, non-fungible tokens, like crypto badges to people who come to your apartment, just sprinkle a little bit of it in there, add Web3, add a little Web3 flavor to your Web2 experiences for people, and you will start to move your network over a little by little. You will spread that knowledge that we need to spread. You will make it a little less cryptic, a little less foreign, and a little less um, scammy sounding. Like people hear cryptocurrency, ah, that's all a scam and so on. But if you show them actual use that's interesting, people will follow you and people will go along. But just don't stay locked into a single platform. I see so many YouTubers complaining that YouTube is demonetizing them and yet they haven't gone anywhere else. Yeah. What they do is they go to Patreon and they try to beg subscribers for donations. And Patreon is also known for deplatforming people, mm -hmm. right? So they're just as at risk at Patreon as they are at YouTube and they can lose both platforms momentarily. Um, so yeah, you have to work on, if you have any network effects, you have to work on spreading those network effects out into other networks. There's some um, uh, cause and effect dynamics at play here because uh, a few months back, uh, the, the YouTube algorithm um, closed the accounts of a few YouTuber, a crypto YouTuber, and everybody went, uh, they tried for alternative, they looked for alternative, they went to LBRY, which I think changed name now, and it, you know, it picked up some speed. So there's a way, like the more these platforms, the centralized platform push, the more people have reasons to find alternatives. And we've seen this very, very clearly in Airbnb this year with the pandemic, because I don't know if you're aware of what happened. Uh, Airbnb, at the beginning of the pandemic, decided unilaterally to cancel every single booking for the next, I don't know, six months and refund completely every single guest. Right? Wow, so you I had, know that. without even talking to the hosts slash partners, and you have these um, families and companies and, and property managers, they're being completely destroyed. You know, they had, I don't know, 100,000 euro worth of bookings coming in, zero. There could have been other ways like, okay, we can move your booking to another date or, we, you know, directly negotiating with the guest for, for a, while, a voucher, whatever. They simply canceled everything. And... Uh, without going into the discussion of if this was fair or not, this happened. And the reaction from the whole, you know, supply side was to go on direct bookings. So what you've been describing a little bit right now. So now everybody's trying to, to find ways to get more direct bookings, but direct bookings are hard because platforms are much more powerful. And Web3 here can solve many of the problems direct bookings have. Number one, reputation. Take your, your reviews from Airbnb and Booking and put them on. Well, for now, they are putting them on another company. Like there's a, there are companies doing this for you. They scrape these reviews, they take them out, and you can use them in your own website. Later on, we're going to have them on the blockchain, right? We have a project on, on Gitcoin for exporting every single review from your accounts and put them a, a little bit like with a protocol like Uniswap, you scrap it and you write it on the blockchain so the host cannot um, tamper with the reviews. And those reviews become the one truth because they've been taken as they were from the platforms, put on the blockchain. So reputation can be one of the big the, the pillars which Web3 takes away from the decentralized OTAs. And payments too, because now if you wanna get a direct payment, the guest is going to say, yeah, I'm going to send you money. And what if you then, you know, you cheat me or you give me a different apartment 
or we can do escrow with smart contracts, right? That's another solution. So Web3 can bring solutions. And I changed my mind recently. I got into this saying, okay, we need to have the Airbnb, Web3 Airbnb. And I realized this is still a few years away. But what we can do now is open protocols, standalone open protocols, which solve specific problems, right? And you mentioned one now for the self-check-in, and I mentioned others. So uh, after what happened with DeFi this summer, I came to realize it's time to build protocols which can be used today. And people will make the effort to, to learn them if there's a real solution to a real problem. They won't get into this if it's like theoretical or uh, even a deplatforming thing for how scary it can be. If it doesn't happen to you, you know, it's like it happens to the others. It's sometimes I have this horrible, um, and I hesitate in mentioning this, but it's like the slaves in, in the cotton fields when the, 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 the white guy, the white boss came and took one away. And they looked there and said, okay, but it didn't happen to me. So probably did something wrong. And the hosts have exactly the same reaction. So you tell them, this guy's been that platform. He had zero, you know, he was completely innocent. And they go like, yeah, no, he must have done so something wrong. And this mentality is, I mean, this is a surf mentality. It's not a citizen mentality. And, sorry. And, um, I want to ask you something about that because you heard about, of course, I guess, uh, about the digital neo feudalism, this concept, right? So basically, on the Web2 platforms, we are not citizens, we are serfs because we can be kicked out from the land anytime. We can work the land, we have to pay some part of the, the food we grow to the, to the Lord, and the Lord can. You know, the Lord is not even a person anymore. It's an algorithm. He can kick us out, kick us out, right? While on Web3, we are citizens because we own this piece of land. It's ours. Nobody can take it away. So when you have your uh, private keys, your, the password you mentioned, nobody can take this away from you. So, yeah, we have to bring real solutions, in my opinion, today. That's a solution to your problem. Make the effort to learn and people will do it. Otherwise they won't. It's too theoretical yet. I agree. Um, I, I agree. I've always been pushing makers to push out a minimum viable product before, you know, making sure it's polished. Just do it. Just launch something. Um, you need that early critical mass of early adopters and enthusiasts to tell you what's wrong, to test it, to improve it, and to also get some people uh, get some people's feedback on the idea to iterate it to improve the UX and gradually scale it up to the mainstream people so they can actually join in and aren't uh, scared or confused by it anymore I love the way you put a digital neo-feudalism it is exactly that so we have we there is no there's no choice um, we are I mean everything is still strongly centralized and we are I mean, even in the crypto space, people are making a lot of elementary mistakes on, on a lot of these projects. Um, you know, like a recent example comes to mind is the Circles UBI that just launched. It's oh, like I joined. I wanted to internet. see how this yeah. works. Yes, go ahead. So it's, it's like uh, they have a triple centralization factor. So they have, they have done nothing really to help things. Um, they, they are hosting the UI themselves and that crashed because of the server load this could have been avoided by using ipfs and by letting people run their own user interface this is yeah. the this is web 3 101 so yeah. this is the elementary mistake of the team number one um, number two is that uh, they are using xdi which is the chain that has a, a few permissioned validators again if that chain stops this is not web 3 that project stops. How many validators and have XDI? Because I'm digging into it a little bit now. So I, I the last time I checked yeah. was over a year ago, and it was under ten. So I have no idea. Oh, a long time ago. Okay. Um, and the the third centralization factor is that they are using the graph, and the graph is a um, is an indexer for blockchain data, 
which just crawls all the blockchain data, turns it into a GraphQL database, and then serves it. Yeah. Which means that this project, to work, has to query somebody else's servers, which are not decentralized. So they rely on this one company to crawl that data for Oh, them. the company is the graph? Yes. Okay. So, the, so there are three, three points of failure here in this project that can be easily exploited if somebody wants to stop this. This is not universal basic income on a global scale. This is universal basic income as an experiment for a month before it dies out because people just aren't picking it up because they're just, you know, they're bringing nothing to the table. There's no benefits of Web3 here yet. I hope they change this, but they've missed the mark entirely on this project. And a lot of Web3 projects do the same thing. So they will pick the easy route out. They will go with Infura, which is a data provider for Ethereum applications. And instead of hosting their own node at home, for example, I have a bunch of servers in this very office running Ethereum nodes and other blockchain nodes that I query directly when I need to interact with the blockchain. If somebody stops Infura, which is a provider for this data, about 70% of all Ethereum applications, of all Web3 applications out there right now, will stop. simply stop. Right. If somebody the graph, the same company I mentioned before, again, 50% of all Web3 apps will simply stop. Now, the graph is working on becoming decentralized, but that's just bringing another layer of incentivization into the mix. So in order to use that network, they have to build a new network effect of people who are willing to run the graph nodes along with other nodes that the graph nodes are reading data from. So this is a complex mess that can be very easily avoided if you just follow DevOps and Web3 101. Step one is make a decentralized user interface so that people can run it locally. And that's just a simple HTML page, like in the good old days. You do not cash is king. So the old saying from the early 2000s, cash is king, is back. Make sure you cash properly. There are so many awesome caching mechanisms in modern browsers with the progressive web apps and lo local storage and NXDB and all of the other stuff that's available in browsers today. Uh, and step three is use IPFS. IPFS is the interplanetary file storage file system where you can store data of any amount, any magnitude, and as long as it's popular, it will start, stay, uh, stay available. It's like torrents, but for any type of data that can be automatically and instantly interpreted without having to be unzipped. And if you combine all three of those, UI on IPFS and let people access it that way, if you utilize caching and uh, cache aggressively in people's browsers so that all the logic and storage happens on their own computers, and then if you combine that with IPFS-based snapshots of previous data so that people don't have to wait for a long time when they load your website for the data to be crawled from the blockchain, instead, they will just download previous snapshots from IPFS and build upon them, you suddenly have a truly decentralized application that cannot be taken down and it doesn't have Cloudflare errors for uh, overwhelming demand of you know, user visits. So um, you, you mean this is, this is laziness on their point or the, is it no, lack no, of no, technical is, knowledge? Yes, this is lack of technical knowledge. Mm. These are all very young people and much like the, the people who raised a lot of money in 2017 with ICOs, mm. these are all kids with no previous development or business experience. They've never this been is burned. So many, yeah, this is yeah. why so many projects from 2017 just burned through the money because right. they have literally no idea what to do with it. Sure. Uh, they were hiring left and right, making promises left and right, and the money just evaporates. And this is the same with technology. You, uh, people will often, like when they have a bunch of money, they will think, all right, let's pick the most advanced stack out there today. Yeah. And then they'll pick something absolutely ridiculous, like mm. a combination of Go and Clojure script and I don't know what else, package manager, that maybe when the project is done as a minimum viable product, seven people in the world will be able to compile. Oh. Um, you don't want that. You want to keep things simple. A minimum viable product is minimal. You want to launch the minimal thing and you want to make sure that it embodies the ethos that you're trying to sell. If you're selling a decentralized application and then that application is not decentralized, then you have completely missed the mark. And it doesn't matter how good your UI is, how good your UX is. If your application relies on a central server, then I might as well go back to Airbnb. Is so, this the fault of tokenization in a way? Like Because they optimize for adoption and tokenomics rather than for long-term decentralization and resilience? 
Um, I I don't know. I think they optimize for. Um, I wouldn't say they optimize for anything really. Uh, <laughs> I would say that they're really trying to get something out. I okay. think most of these teams very quickly realize that they bit more than they can chew. Mm-hmm. And then they transition into, most of them start with, we'll build a fully decentralized this and that, this and that. Yeah. But then as things start to progress, um, p- others on the team will tell them, yeah, yeah, but, um, if we want to do it this way, it's going to take three extra months and then they'll make a compromise and then they'll say, all right, okay. then just use Infura and we'll transition later. And then they never do. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of rushing, a uh, combination of kind of fiduciary duties to token holders, oh. um, especially if VCs in, invested in the tokens. Oh yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's always um, a red flag. Yeah. VCs, right? And so mm. then you have this problem of, you know, getting a product that's neither, you know, that has the worst of all worlds. It's neither decentralized nor good. Um, And this is what most projects from 2017 really are. And then you get pivots that, you know, like, I don't know, three years in, they'll realize that their their original mission will never succeed. So they start funding alternative things to just, you know, regain favor of the community, uh, building, I don't know, Ethereum 2.0 clients, financing research on messaging or, I don't know, stuff like that. But there are many companies that just, you know, completely lost track at the beginning. And then Mm -hmm. it's just not, they they just didn't follow. They they tried to be experts without having experts. And so they picked the most complicated stack they could pick and uh, realized that they can't, you know, launch with that stack. Instead of just following the MVP principles, you know, just launch something, do iterative design, uh, give it to the people, work on every identified problem uh, in a very targeted way, eliminate that problem, move on. You know, don't try to tackle it all at once. What would be a project you, you, you would recommend as a good example of good practices to follow? Good practices to follow. Um, like for, for, you know, for yes, yeah, these young kids get the idea, get maybe the money, etc., and then they need some you know, something to, some pattern to copy, right? And say, okay, let's do like these guys, for instance. Yeah, so the poster child for, for, for doing it well is Uniswap. Oh, um, okay. I was thinking about that, but I didn't want to push it there. Yeah, yeah. but so Uniswap, Uniswap is, is like, also some, some problem, yeah. right? Or? U- Uniswap is like the, the poster child for this. Okay. So you, Hayden, when he built Uniswap, he based it on an idea from before, from a forum. Mm. Um, and he had been learning to code for not a very long time before that. So Mm. it was just, it was literally an MVP for him. Mm. He launched it, it worked, but it was never supposed to be the final version. And when V1 was launched, he immediately got to work on V2. Mm. In the meanwhile, V1 became the most popular decentralized exchange protocol on the blockchain ever. And it got tremendous volume. And it had its up and downs in the in the in between that as well because um, the Uniswap user interface was extremely user friendly. It was very easy to use. It didn't start that way. So the first version was pretty clumsy. It had that retro feel, but it didn't really feel like. Um, I know it would scare a lot of the normies, right? So iterations got it to the point of from this token to this token this many, that's it. Three fields and you click the swap button and it works. So this was also the MVP process. So he launched a version, then iterated on it and so on. And then uh, when he got warning from the US government or whoever to not let certain countries use that UI, he had to comply because it was known that he was behind that UI. And he had to ban Iranians and who knows who else. I, I don't remember right now. But the, the advantage of Web3 was already tangible there. Because as soon as those bans went in, as soon as the UI started being inaccessible to those countries, alternative UIs popped up. And that's where the benefit of Web3 instantly became obvious. So his UI was no longer um, necessary. We didn't need it. 
we had a bunch of other UI interacting with the same smart contract, doing whatever people wanted to do without those bans in effect. Hayden, the author, was safe because he did what they told him to, prevent the UI from serving these people. But everybody else who didn't care about this warning just made alternative UIs or used the smart contract directly. And it worked, it just worked. And now V2 is out. And V2 had new revolutionary uh, code in there and, and a UI revamp and a bunch of other useful things. And is it over? No, V3 is on its way. So he's already working on the next one. But what's important is that it was launched as an MVP and it was decentralized from the beginning. It was Uniswap never relied on any centralized infrastructure that could be stopped. And that's, that's the main that's selling the point there. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think about the VC involvement with uh, with Uniswap? Is this, I mean, do you think there is space for some for, for venture capital in these pro in projects, or is this limited, or should be no venture capital at all? Because Uniswap, they they raised some money, and the reaction was like after a week, Sushi Swap was there, uh, sucking liquidity, etc. Uh, what is your take on? external investment or investments in general, because you know, it's just how should this project project gets, get money in, if they need to get money, basically? I think uh, developer fees built into the protocol. Yeah. Um, I think they capture value where it's most apparent. Like if people don't use your thing, you don't get money. And that's the best way to, to charge for your work if you did something awesome. Um, in terms of VC involvement, I generally just ignore VCs wherever. Um, I don't care much for them. I don't. I, I wish they weren't involved anywhere, not just in crypto, but in startup culture in general. I don't think it's necessary. I think um, th this whole Silicon Valley culture is clinical insanity, and I don't think it's necessary on any level. So I don't really pay attention to to VCs all that much. Um, Whenever I hear they're involved in some project, I hope that they don't mess it up a lot. I know that they're gonna mess it up to some degree. Okay. It's never good. Um, they will usually invest with the hopes. I mean, the VC is by definition an entity which invests with the hopes of an exit. Of course. So I don't want, you know, in my, I don't want uh, somebody who's looking to run away as soon as possible in my decentralized project. There's no exit in, in this in these protocols. Yeah, there should so be no exit. I, yeah, there, there's no exit. There should be no exit. And by definition, if you're trying to exit, that means you're you're going to harm the other investors because you're going to dump some tokens on them. So this is why I don't really, I don't care for them. I don't pay attention to them. But there's nothing we can do. VCs are gonna be there whether we want to or not. Can you tell me a little bit about Polkadot? I, honestly, I haven't followed because, you know, when it's layer one, it gets really, really technical. Um, I know what Polkadot is, but, you know, uh, you're involved with them. So I guess you are betting on, on this being one or the solution for the scaling problem. So, yeah, please tell me a little bit about, about it. Um, so Polkadot is just a communication relay for other blockchains. Uh, it's not the solution to the scaling problem. It's okay. uh, it's an assist method for other chains' scaling problems. So Polkadot has this relay chain, this one master blockchain in the middle that's launched, that's public, that can be used today. And it also has shards like many of these other blockchains. But these shards, they're called parachains or parallel chains. Um, they connect to Polkadot, but... They don't have to be, like other chains have homogeneous shards. This means that every shard is the same. Every shard has the same logic on it. So on Ethereum, you're going to have a lot of EVM shards. So Ethereum virtual machine shards, you'll be able to deploy the same solidity code to each of them. Um, Polkadot has heterogeneous shards, which means that every shard, every chain that connects to it can be completely different and application specific. So you can... Uh, make one chain that's really good at one specific thing and then you can have another chain that's really good at one specific thing and they don't have to have any overlap but they will communicate this is where um, the scaling magic comes from is that if you optimize a chain a coffee chain for just coffee transactions 
then this can have really, really fast transactions and you don't have to wait long to get much security and so on. And you, have the, you can optimize it on the low level for storage and for speed and for a lot of things that need for these coffee transactions to be processed instantly, right? Um, on the other hand, if you have something slow and sluggish like Bitcoin, um, you often wait for like an hour for a confirmation there to, to, to arrive for a transaction. So this would not be good for a coffee chain. But by letting them communicate through Polkadot, you can actually send messages to and from Bitcoin to the coffee chain. Or for example, like Bitcoin today is completely inert. Like, uh, uh, right? So people buy it in the hopes that number will go up. Um, there's no other use for Bitcoin. It's, it's gasoline that can pay for its own transport and not anything else. So it's literally. Um, but if you want to put Bitcoin into DeFi, you can use any of the protocols on Ethereum right now to go into decentralized finance. But those usually rely on, again, kind of walled off solutions. There are two kind of popular ones right now. One is wrapped BTC, where you literally have to trust an organization to keep your Bitcoin. Yeah. And then they will mint a Bitcoin token on Ethereum for you. Again, yeah. trust. And then there's the other one, which is TBTC, which will... Um, rely on a bunch of um, nodes that will keep your Bitcoin for you in a decentralized, in a more decentralized way. So they all have to agree to keep that Bitcoin and they collateralize that. So they put some money down as a guarantee that they'll behave. And the money they put down has to exceed whatever they, they can hold for you. And so again, they will then create a token on Ethereum. Um, with Polkadot, you just connect Bitcoin to Polkadot, and then you connect Ethereum to Polkadot. And you can send a message from one to the other, regardless of the method that's being used. So these bridges will take care of things. But that, that's, um, and so then you get Bitcoin in Ethereum, but that's, that's not all you get, because once they're connected to this hub, to this relay chain, you get communication with all other chains as well. So for example, uh, Bitcoin will then be able to communicate with a chain that's focusing on NFTs, on crypto art. It will also be able to communicate with a chain that does real estate or real estate bookings. Um, you will be able to get collateral for your house loan in Bitcoin directly through Polkadot through these messages. So we're basically connecting all of these different chains, completely different chains, um, through one hub that lets them communicate with certain message guarantees so that the chains are guaranteed to understand each other and uh, properly process these messages that arrive. And that's all there is to Polkadot really. So it's just a chain that's used to connect other chains. It's, it's trustless, of course. So the moment I connect Bitcoin to Ethereum, there's no third, third party risk basically here. Yes, correct. So you, okay. have, you, have these, you have these parachains that have to have their own, um, uh, they don't need validators because all parachains share the security of the relay chain. The validators of the chain, so the miners, are only on the master relay chain, but they also secure all the connected chains. So the connected chains don't have to have their own validators or miners. They're all secured by the master chain. And the master relay chain, um, the more money is in it, the more secure every other connected chain is. Um, so the, the, as soon as you connect that in there, all the chains share that security level and they can talk to each other. Uh, I, I think I understand the power of this. And if I understand correctly, this is, this is empowering everybody here in, in, in orders of magnitude bigger than what we have now. And I, um, I've been playing with XDAI centralized and everything, but it gave me a glimpse of what you're talking about because we have uh, our tokens, they are TRIPS and people cooperate to the, to the project and every month they, they request their, their, their tokens for the work they've done, right? So we send to them and of course we spend a lot of money in gas and that's horrible. Uh, so I was playing the other day with um, XDAI, I went to Omnibridge and I, it's, you know, Omni, okay. So I was able to send uh, 100,000 tokens and transform them in basically X trips or trips on X die. And the gas fees there are zero. Let's forget for a moment that I could lose them tomorrow morning if everything goes down, right? Uh, but the feeling of moving these tokens for basically no fees, um, 
that changes everything because now I'm telling people, okay, we send you trips or we send you X trips and we send you more of them. Like you get a bonus because we save money on gas. And whatever we do on this uh, X, X die chain um, is it, stuff we couldn't do on, on Ethereum, right? So that makes the original trips much more powerful, much more flexible, much cheaper in any, in any way. So a solution like Polkadot is making even Bitcoin, as you mentioned, a more um, uh, flexible, fast, cheap, and interconnected token. So without losing its own characteristic, which is the safety and the, the store of value. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying. I'm sure nobody else understands unless they've been, they've done this step of, of playing on, on parallel chains on uh, layer twos or whatever. But uh, yeah, amazing, amazing. So what's the time frame for when are we going to be able to see projects and tokens and we use Polkadot for these use cases? So we currently have a testnet up that has five parachains connected and people are already testing those. So parachain candidates that intend to become parachains are already playing there and deploying their, their test chains onto this, this network. Um, we are expecting to um, have parachains on the Kusama network within a few months. And the Kusama network is basically like the canary cousin of Polkadot. It's, it's not a test net, but it's like a more uh, uh, risk-friendly network that we use for checking out how things work, um, verifying economic theories, uh, adding new logic in there that might never end up on Polkadot. There's interesting stuff. I'm a big fan of, of the Kusama network. So, uh, and, and then after the things have proven themselves on Kusama, they will be deployed on Polkadot as well, uh, which will happen early next year at the latest. So parachains are coming uh, soon. And right now people are mainly building their chains to be future compatible with the parachains when they launch. Because uh, Polkadot and Kusama are built on this framework called Substrate. And Substrate is like a, just a framework for building blockchains. And it lets you spin up a blockchain. I have a few video tutorials online that like let you power up a blockchain in half an hour, a custom blockchain for your own purpose. Um, so you are day with Substrate, you need like days to produce an optimized blockchain for your specific purpose. And then you can connect it to the greater Polkadot ecosystem because it's automatically compatible. Oh, so you, you, let's say I, I want to do, okay, I like Bitcoin, but it's too slow. Uh, I want to make it a bit faster without losing too much of its security. I basically play with settings and launch it. And then I have. Yes, we actually have a tutorial on building a clone of Bitcoin on Substrate and it takes like an hour to get through and you get Bitcoin on Substrate and you get the exact same functionality. It's all there um, and it's automatically compatible. Like you, there, actually there, there's, a, there's a chain in production live right now that uses proof of work. Um, called Kulupu, but it's, it's, um, using, um, it's using Monero's or Zcash's algorithm for mining, I think, or Endomex. And um, it's, 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 it's quite popular. It, it will have smart contract, but it's a proof of work uh, chain that will have smart contracts, right? And it's based on Substrate as well, and it can easily connect to Polkadot, or it can even have its own parachains later on. Uh, we have no idea where that's going to go, but it's an interesting experiment. There's a bunch of them. Like there's a copy of Ethereum called Moonbeam. It's a direct clone of everything only. And even you can connect to it with MetaMask and Truffle and every tool that exists for Ethereum, but it's based on Substrate and it works with Polkadot. And it had, they have a public testnet out right now. I also did a screencast not so long ago where I ported some of my old Solidity code to this by literally just copy pasting it. So it all, it all works, right? You have, you have a substrate-based, Polkadot-friendly Ethereum ready to go. So it's, the, the, the press has been talking about Polkadot as the Ethereum killer, but I don't think that was the idea at the beginning, right? It's just like... No, no, it's just that gets clicks, but it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not an Ethereum killer. It's like 
Polkadot can help Ethereum scale, right? Yeah. Ethereum 2.0 will launch as it is and it will have shards and it's going to be scalable and it's going to be fast and it's going to be great. It's going to have a lot of validators and so on. But also if you bridge it to Polkadot, you just give it extra abilities. You give it the ability to connect to all the other connected chains. And uh, if somebody else builds some awesome functionality on a custom chain, uh, that just means that they don't have to build it on Ethereum, right? So that, because Ethereum will be able to communicate with that chain through Polkadot. That, that's all there is to it. I see, I see. Wow, amazing, amazing, great. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would speak three hours with you. This is, <laughs> it's really interesting at every level, but I think we kind of covered everything. Uh, let me ask you a last quick thing, because in the last two or three days, I've been playing again with XDAI, uh, without even looking at what XDAI is, and now you tell me, careful, it's uh, well, it's basically centralized, um, or it's not I mean, centralized it's not, enough. It's not that, yeah, it, it doesn't have too like, many nodes, right? Yeah. Um, but have you seen what's been happening? You mentioned Circle. Uh, you probably heard about Honey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I, I was looking today, uh, Honey Swap, which reached like five million in liquidity. It was two million two days ago, three days ago. Uh, I see a danger now. This could be growing because of the low fees uh, very quickly and at the same time, not decentralizing and it, it could really end up in, in a disaster. What, what's your take on this? Because Wait, you know, people about... as me, we're not so technical. We, we understand that the reason for gas, but we are kind of, we feel constrained and if something like this comes up. We're going to jump into it, right? Without thinking too much. So please, Give us some a, a word of advice here. How far shall we go before we hurt ourselves, basically? Because this morning, uh, so five I, minutes before launching with you, I created a trips and X die pair on Honeyswap, like fifty dollars, whatever. But you know, I like to play and I like to think too much. I like to be hurt later, so I learn uh, later. But no, it's I mean, it's fine. Advice. Yeah, uh, P uh, P POA and X die have existed for a long time. I don't think they're going anywhere. Okay. Um, but it's it's the same level of confidence that I would have in trusting a I don't launch my websites and my projects on Amazon Web Services okay. because I don't want to launch them on a centralized uh, infrastructure. I know that AWS goes down very rarely, uh, but I know that when it goes down, it takes half the internet with it. I don't I and usually when it goes down, I'll be sitting comfortably in my chair. Uh, smiling at all the apps that are down while mine are still working. I just, I don't like relying on other people's servers. And that's the only motivation that I have there. If XDAI and POA work for you or for anybody else, that's totally fine. I don't want to let you know, force people to go full web or they can. Uh, I would like to see more web three things. I would like to see more decentralized networks, but, you know, XDAI and POA really aren't going anywhere anytime soon, just like Amazon's not going to disappear completely and make all of the websites unavailable. Um, they're still going to be around. Yes, they can be taken down by a government or something. Uh, I don't know. They can be, you know, shut down. But the, the chances of there are extremely slim there's no reason to shut them down really and they're they're not i mean they're not, not too small so uh, honey swap and and xdai in general a fun side chain with an interesting concept where you don't pay for gas with eth you pay for gas with the xdai token okay. and that's a good idea on its own what I would prefer to, is to see alternative implementations of this on Substrate. Mm -hmm. So this chain can be rebuilt on Substrate. Um, it can be its own network, or it can be a chain that connects to Polkadot as a parachain. You can also configure this to have free transactions or to charge for transactions in a native token that doesn't really, um, that matches DAI effectively on Ethereum but, or anywhere else. When you recreate this on Substrate, uh, you're not recreating XDAI, you're, you're starting from Ethereum. Is that correct? No, I mean, you can, you, it just depends on the implementation details. Mm. So with Substrate, you just, you do whatever you want. Um, if I want to create a chain, uh, the token of which can only be created by bridging from Ethereum, 
I can do that. Um, there are actually already bridges in action with Ethereum. So I can create XDAI there on Substrate and I can make it mint tokens if I send tokens from Ethereum through my Substrate XDAI but bridge. What will be the advantage for XDAI to migrate, if that's the correct word, on Substrate? Uh, the ability to easily connect to Polkadot later if they want to. So Substrate-based chains have native connectivity to Polkadot. And, they and, can and then plug to in the, all the other tokens, basically. To all the other. So yeah, do, do you see a world tokens. where whatever token I have, and you no, know, we've been talking about this and thinking about this since the Atomic Swap idea came out. Any token I have, as long as it has liquidity, is spendable anywhere with any other token, like... You want Bitcoin, I send you XDAI, you get Bitcoin. Is that the future in a way? Sure, in a way, yeah. If we, like, or you have a smart contract with Ransom Nether, but I have any other token, it's, I can still pay my gas with any other token as long as there's uh, liquidity because behind the scenes is exchanged. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, uh, that, that whole thing is going to change anyway. Okay. Uh, the, the, the contracts are going to be pre-funded with fees for users to use. Um, users will have, you know, like I see it as a different evolution. I don't see gas in the future at all in okay. a way. I see it more like um, a contract will check if an interactor has a certain token and then will be executed for free, paid from the balance of that uh, contract itself. So you would basically give users permission slips to use your uh, contract free of charge, stuff like that. Um, so, but, but what you're describing, yes, definitely. So when that all is connected and when that all, when all of those chains can indeed talk to each other, yes, you will be able to pay for anything and receive anything in any currency that anybody prefers on either side. Um, as long as there is liquidity. The thing to note is that, uh, there, there will be like one huge advantage that Ethereum has right now and it's, that it's probably going to lose in, in the sharding space as well and that Polkadot will not have is uh, transactions that are instantly executed across, across contracts. So, across, um, I'm sorry? Across contracts. So contracts, synchronous okay. transactions, yeah. So synchronous transactions will not be a thing you have to, like, if you have multiple chains that your message has to hop through, they have to wait for a block between every message pass to, to execute. So on Polkadot blocks are six seconds, but even if you have like five chains to go through, that's going to be 30 seconds of wait time for a command to execute a really complex trade or something like that. And that the same thing is going to be on, on uh, Ethereum, right? Because one contract is going to be on one shard, another is going to be on another shard. It's going to be a, 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 you know, like a combination of, of delays that you have to tolerate. So we are going to lose a bit of UX and that's going to have to be abstracted away in the user interface. So that's where UX and UI will become extremely important. Um, but we're going to get the scalability that, that we've been wanting all along. Okay, last question and then I, I, I'll let you go. Uh, time frame: when are we going to see, and you know, if are we going to see mainstream adoption of Web3 solutions on the internet. So and when is it going to be normal for most people to, to use these technologies knowingly or not? Doesn't matter if they know it, right? And then we can say, okay, this is now mainstream. If, if, even, I don't know if the question even makes sense, but you know, just to have an idea, how long are we talking about? Two years, five years, 10 years? Um... I, I'm optimistic for two years-ish. It depends on external factors, how much they push people over the edge. So if we can uh, keep relying on the US to be as censorship friendly as they are, and if we can keep, uh, if we can be sure that they're gonna keep, uh, you know, deplatforming people, putting people in jail for whistleblowing, um, doing illegal things abroad, waging oil wars, um, just, you know, doing, and then you see the platforms like Twitter removing tweets that they think is yeah. fake news or whatever, and then yeah. deciding that something else is not fake news. The more of that we see, the faster that adoption will happen. Uh, it's just, it, it's a catch-22. You don't want too much of it to happen because then people are going to be locked out of finding out that there even exists an alternative. 
So you kind of want, you know, like a, as they move toward, as they move with the censorship, like in, you have to kind of, kind of keep up and just follow them along. And, you know, like it's, it's, it's kind of like they're, um, they're replacing, we're replacing the road that they're digging up. Oh. Um, we were going behind them and we're putting in new pavement behind them so that people who are now, you know, like on a dirt road, we give them, Hey guys, th there's a, there's a different option here. Come, come over. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have to keep, we have to like, as long as they, they stay as draconic as they are in terms of being trigger happy with, with sensors and so on. Uh, I'm pretty confident we can pull it off in, in two years or so. But it's gonna be it's gonna rely on user experience a lot. It's gonna rely on UIs, it's gonna rely like good user interface design has never been more important than it is right now. Um, even Uniswap with its three fields, three input fields, is uh, orders of magnitude more complicated and hard to understand than my parents would want it to be understood. Um, okay. so UI projects that um, that build on top of existing projects but improve their ui will now become essential uh, one example is dharma uh, which from a technical perspective i'm not too big a fan of but from a ux perspective these guys are doing what they should be doing so they are really polishing the ux part and they're getting to the point where they can just shove an app into somebody's hand and they'll know how it works what it does so this, this is what we need. We need people, we need revolutionary UX so that people are not afraid of clicking buttons anymore. And I, as, as technically savvy as I am, I'm still afraid of clicking some buttons <laughs> in the web free space. So um, like, uh, you know, just, just opening any website that lists all the tokens that you've approved is, is a horror show. Yeah. So, you know, stuff like that needs to be completely removed. Okay, uh, Bruno, you are a public speaker and a consultant. You offer what, what kind of services do you offer? If if you know anybody would like to ask for your help, um, no, I just educate. So it's educate. just pure, purely education, proof of concept tutorials. I will do some like if you, I will do free consulting of, for projects that want to consider substrate or or polkadot. I will talk to anybody about uh, about it and try to explain and demystify what they can get from this and what they cannot get from this. So I don't want to sell any illusions um, and I don't want to, you know, get people on board of some tech just for the sake of getting them on, on board of some tech. Um, if anybody has any questions about building on Polkadot or on Substrate uh, or, you know, Ethereum versus Polkadot versus Ava versus whatever else, I'm there, you know, like I can, I can help clarify this in, in, um, you know, as objectively as I, as I can be. Um, and I will try to give you, to point you to some resources and help you out with uh, developing and point you to some developers and point you to some consultants, point you to whoever you need to progress with your goal. So people are free to get in touch uh, with that. But other than that, I'm completely, you know, like in, in the Web3 Foundation. If people do want, however, I have to, I have to have one thing to show. If people want to find out about Web3 from the Polkadot side, I do have a newsletter that I keep up weekly, weekly for all core development, for all governance, because Polkadot has on-chain governance. That's something I didn't mention. Um, we have governance that lets us upgrade the chain without forking. So we will upgrade, update a new runtime onto the chain and all nodes that are running the chain will download that runtime and um, automatically upgrade. So you don't have to download a new node and replace it and run it and f cause forks and so on, right? So the chain can auto upgrade, it's auto enforceable. You upload the runtime and it will automatically apply that at a certain block. Um, so all updates regarding the governance, regarding the treasury that's on chain as well, uh, regarding the core development ecosystem updates and so on are in the newsletter at .leap.substack.com or just .leap.com. Uh, .dot Yeah, D-O-T okay. leap, L-E-A-P uh, okay. .com. And where can people find you? I found you on um, Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter, just uh, at Bitfalls, at B-I-T-F-A-L-L-S. Um, I'm, I'm there, so just hit me up if Amazing. you want to talk. Bruno, that was really great. Thank you very much. And then this is going to go on, on YouTube and our channel, and I'm going to share it with you and with everybody else when it's ready. Thank you very much. Thanks, my pleasure. Have a nice day.
Bye. Ciao. Bye.